my god, you got a GTX 1080, gimme, is probably what half of you are saying right now. The other half is probably pissed that there's another 1080 review. It's been done to death, I get that. But I've been waiting since June for this. Also, I spent $700 on this thing, so let's see if it was well worth the money. That's like actual money. It is actual money. <laughs> When the 10 series from NVIDIA was officially announced, believe me when I say that, I was blown away by the performance numbers. Being able to acquire one at all just seemed like a fantasy, especially considering the price tag of some of the aftermarket ones. Now that I actually have one and I can see how it fits my needs, starting with the specs, the Extreme 1080 from Gigabyte sports a shiny new GP104 Pascal chip from NVIDIA, which is just a fancy way of saying it's a 1080. Alongside that is 8 gigs of GDDR5X VRAM exclusive to the Pascal line of GPUs. With a 1784 MHz GPU clock and either 1894 MHz boost in gaming mode or 1936 MHz boost in OC mode, the Extreme 1080 is no stranger when it comes to overclocking. Other than the fact that the GTX 1080 can run at 8K 60Hz on a single display, I highly doubt that any of you will be doing so, but will rather use the more common and cost effective method of using dual 4K monitors. Speaking of DisplayPort, the Extreme 1080 sports three of them in version 1.4, as well as one Dual Link DVI and one HDMI 2.0. But what's this on the other end? Another two HDMI ports? What? Why? Well, Gigabyte took it upon themselves to add these to connect to either one of two VR brackets in both PCIe and five and a quarter inch drive bay variants. The PCIe slot bracket features two additional HDMI ports that you can route from the front end of the graphics card to the back for more places to plug your VR headset into. But the 5.25 inch bay bracket also features dual USB 3.0 ports with a cable to hook into your spare USB 3 header on your motherboard. Unfortunately, I don't have a spare USB 3.0 motherboard header, but by the time I'm able to afford a VR headset, I will probably have switched to X99 and will have a motherboard with dual headers. However, keep in mind that using these two HDMI pass-throughs will disable the two circle DisplayPort 1.4 connectors on the rear I.O. of the card. Well, that's great and all, but how does it look? If it's anything like the whole 660 Ti fiasco, I'm not getting it. Well, I'll leave that up to you. Personally, I think the Extreme 1080 looks amazing from any angle, even if it's a little chubby. The card is mostly black with some white here and there, along with some orange accents. There's a custom backplate included, and it isn't very surprising to see one on a card of this caliber which features a black and white Extreme Gaming logo and some orange stripes going down the length of the card. I kind of wish that these were either white or something color neutral to match people's color schemes better, but this can easily be fixed with some Plasti Dip and painter's tape. Unfortunately, the backplate doesn't reach all the way across the card, exposing some of the angular heat fins, which can easily get bent. So keep that in mind when you finally get yours, and you're so ecstatic to just throw it into your system like a sack of potatoes. Wait, why would you be putting potatoes in? Never mind. As I said before, the card's a little chubby, and that's not because of all of the efficient power consumption that the dual 8-pin connectors are towering down on like Oreos. Yes, dual 8-pin connectors as opposed to the Founders Edition single 8-pin connector, indicating that this is a custom PCB. Not only this, but the Extreme 1080 features Gigabyte's aerospace-grade PCB coating to protect against disturbances such as heavy dust buildup, corrosion, and even moisture. Good white. <laughs> Bad. Good work, Gigabyte. Keeping an eye out for water cooler. The reason for this chubbiness is Gigabyte's patented Windforce Stack Design cooling solution. Yes, I know it isn't the fanciest name in the world, but hear me out. As shown on literally every other triple fan graphics card, all of the fans are spaced out. However, Gigabyte decided to go a different route and managed to get what should be an over 300 millimeter graphics card under 300 millimeters. Yep, Gigabyte broke the laws of physical dimensions. What they did is took three 100 millimeter double ball bearing fans and inset the center one by a tiny bit, thus allowing the two on the sides to overlap the edges. This not only allows for a shorter card with bigger fans, but it also improves airflow because the center fan spins in the opposite direction. Across the top of the center fan is a large X shape to complement the Extreme Gaming branding. This as well as the Extreme Gaming logo and fan stop icons are on the side are all RGB illuminated. But then again, what wasn't RGB illuminated at Computex this year? You may be able to tell by the dimensions of the box that there's a little bit more than a high-end graphics card in there. Although you can get a model without the included goodies if you'd so desire. However, for the exact same price as the Founders Edition 1080, 
you get free items that come along with the card. Included in the box is the before mentioned five and a quarter inch and PCIe bracket HDMI passers, a high bandwidth gigabyte extreme gaming SLI bridge, a gigabyte XMP 300 mouse pad with sewn edges to prevent fraying, a paper folder containing the extended four year warranty that you can sign up for, a wrist protector, a dual six pin to single eight pin adapter and an extreme gaming case badge to proudly display your GPU manufacturer outside your case if you don't have a window or people are just blind and don't see the Gigabyte Extreme Gaming branding flashing an RGB strobe effect. And after all of that, you stuck around to see the benchmarks? You deserve a cookie, though Gigabyte didn't include one in the box. As any GTX 1080 entails, it's an absolute monster of games. I bet that I have you hooked right now and you want to get one immediately. Well, not so fast. As I said earlier, I've been waiting since June to get this card. I even switched between three resellers in a matter of a week because I kept finding it for better and better deals. Anyway, I was finally able to get it through Newegg and even opted for three day shipping for nearly $54 less than Amazon. Now, I don't blame Gigabyte for taking so long. There were news articles for a while saying that there'd be a GP104 shortage until late July and into August, as well as quite a few people reporting that their card was DOA, or dead on arrival, or the surprisingly plastic shroud was just a bit too short and one of the fans would hit up against it. So I like to see that as Gigabyte's hiatus period where they were working out all of the problems. But anyways, I was just happy to be able to secure one and was surprised to see that they were in stock 17 hours after the post was made. Time to get personal. No, not that kind of personal. Never assume anything unless directed otherwise. I'm talking about my personal opinion and why it shows this aftermarket 1080 rather than the dozens of other options, with four of those being from Gigabyte alone, five if you include the Founders Edition card. What a lot of people do when choosing PC parts and aren't directed about compatibility or price is look for the best looking swan out of the flock. Sorry, ugly duckling, you're sitting this one out. Yes, guilty as charged, I mainly went with this card based on aesthetics. Of course, it was only second nature to go and check the specs immediately afterwards. Surprisingly enough, a lot of graphics card manufacturers don't use a lot of colors. It kind of upsets me when I see them stick to one theme in particular. But once again, I'm not routing out companies because their graphics cards suck or look bad. But I really like the road that Gigabyte was traveling down in terms of VR. The VR Link extenders are an amazing idea, so that you don't have to use up the only HDMI port on the back of your graphics card, but instead have two additional ones for wherever you plug your VR headset into. Now here's the thing that a lot of people get confused about, especially if they're new to computer components when it comes to upgrading all of that. In my methodology, you should only upgrade your components for three reasons. If they perform slower with age, if they can't perform how you intend, or you're in dire need of an upgrade. Starting off with age, you can have the same PC hardware for years and years and have it treat you perfectly fine and do everything that you want it to. However, if you use this equipment all the time, you may not realize that it's starting to show the wrinkles that come with old age, such as increased temperatures, possibly due to old thermal compound, or frame drops due to overuse. This is really only a problem if you're constantly using your components at full load for years, which can dramatically decrease the lifespan. Next is about future-proofing other components. Say you get a current-gen graphics card and keep it for four or so years, but upgrade all of your other parts, CPU, motherboard, RAM, etc., to fit your needs, but your graphics card is lagging behind. It just can't keep up to the tasks that you're throwing at it, such as 4K gaming or extreme rendering tasks. This not only works for your GPU, but really any major component that you're using a lot. My current processor, the i5-4690K, just barely passes the line before serious bottlenecking happens, which you can learn more about up here. Which means that in two or more years, I'm going to try to switch to a beefier processor, such as the i7-4790K, or maybe switch to x99 and get a 5820K to prevent such bottlenecks. Lastly is serious upgrading, which ties to the previous reason. I've seen a lot of people on social media talking about how they're still running GTX 700 series cards or the AMD equivalent. 
I will agree when I say that the 1000 series is the regeneration to upgrade to. With its Titan X killing performance and efficiency, as well as its price point, with the GTX 1060 just being over $250 for some variants, as well as AMD SKU for $200 and below. As you can see from the benchmarks, I'm running a 960 right now, and that's great for a system like mine. However, I'm trying to push it at nearly 4K resolution. Thanks again, LG, for the monitor. It can run games just fine, even if I have to tone down the settings a bit. It's just that when my car dips below 30 FPS, even when I do run these settings, then it's not necessarily fun to play. The common answer for this is just not run at full 3440 by 1440, right? True, but I spent 13 hours of my life putting something together to win this monitor, and after first receiving one broken, I'm going to use this thing to its full potential. Even if I'm not running in windowed mode, regular HD looks really weird, especially with the black bars on the sides of the monitor due to its native 21 by 9 aspect ratio. So in conclusion, the 1080 dominates 4K at max settings no matter what game, and the Gigabyte Extreme Gaming is a great addition to your gaming rig if you set aside the money for a moment like this, you just want to get the most out of your gaming experience, or want the numerous added benefits that come with this card for the same price as the Founders Edition. My name is George, and I'll see you in the next video.